Welcome to Garden DC, the podcast about everything gardening in the Washington DC and Mid-Atlantic region. I'm your host, Kathy Jentz. I'm the editor of Washington Gardener Magazine, and we're aimed at gardening enthusiasts, people who grow everything from edibles to ornamentals, natives to exotics. If it grows in our area, that's what we talk about. This week on the Garden DC podcast, I'm joined by Louise Clark, horticulturalist with the Morris Arboretum outside of Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. Welcome, Louise. Well, thanks, Kathy. How are you today? Great. And you? I am fine. I was just up on my green roof today. Well, I hope you weren't too blown away. We were having some major windstorms coming through this week in the Mid-Atlantic. Yes, it was windy here too, but I had my safety harness on. (laughs) <laughs> okay, so we're going to talk to Louise all about green roofs and walls and precautions and safety harnesses and, and most importantly, what plants we can grow up on these surfaces. Uh, but first, Louise, let's talk a little bit about you. So how did you get up onto that roof? How did you get this job at the Morris Arboretum? Well, that's kind of a long story, but we'll we'll shorten that a bit. I was a career changer, so I was formerly a clinical laboratory scientist toiling away behind a microscope for 20 years, um, diagnosing cancer or pre-malignant cells. And I finally decided I need to get away from that microscope. I needed to get outdoors. And I always loved plants and had a garden and decided, I think I'm going to try this as a career change. So uh, indeed I did. I left the laboratory uh, went to Temple University here in Philadelphia, got myself a bachelor's degree in environmental design and horticulture. And I took an internship, a year-long position with the Morris Arboretum in Philadelphia, which is part of the University of Pennsylvania. And I was very fortunate to be in the right place at the right time. So as my internship was expiring, there was a vacancy on staff for horticulturist. And the Arboretum at that time was building a brand new um, Platinum LEED, L-E-E-D, Certified Horticulture Center. And atop the garages that we were building, we were having green roofs. So I literally have been there since the beginning to see those green roofs from construction to planting to maintenance. Wow. And how long has that LEED certified building been there? That was opened in the spring of 2010. So it's actually not a new building anymore. It's going on its 12th anniversary. And when one visits the Morris Arboretum, that's on the side of, I guess, the campus, we could call it, that's not normally publicly accessible, correct? That is correct. Unfortunately, the public does not get to enjoy my labors unless we're having a a special event where Bloomfield Farm is open. And due to our last year with COVID restrictions, we have had virtually no public events on the farm. So we are hopeful that that will change later this year. Morris Arboretum, who was it named for? How did it come into an existence? Uh, Well, the Morris Arboretum was originally a private estate of Quaker brothers, sister, John and Lydia Morris. Um, Their father was the founder and owner of the I.P. Morris Iron Works in Philadelphia. So that's how the family came into their wealth. Um, John was a graduate of Haverford College in engineering. Um, so he studied, and his his sister Lydia was, of course, just a lady of leisure, um, and neither of them married. So they decided to live together in a lovely mansion called Compton, which is on the was on the top of the hill at the Morris Arboretum. Unfortunately, the mansion is no longer there. And they both lived there until their deaths. So in 1932, when Lydia passed, she deeded her estate to the University of Pennsylvania for it to become a teaching institution and for the university to use it for botanical um, development, science, education. And they were also hopeful that it would become an educational institution for people um, in the green industry. Was that fulfilled? It sounds like that mission has really come into fruition. I would say yes, their, their vision was really fulfilled. We do education. Again, we're kind of a truncated schedule now because of COVID, but We have a whole series of classes for professional development for arborists. 
uh, for our lay public, for professional horticulturists. We're a co-sponsoring institution for um, such things up here as the Woody Plants Conference, which is held annually at Swarthmore College. Um, and we have internship programs. So yes, we're very strong in education. And you know what my mind correlates when I hear the word Morris Arboretum or the name is that winding hill when you come up the entrance of of nice grassy kind of prairie-like um, landscape and those sheep cutouts <laughs> that, yeah. are on, that are on the side of the hillside. And so that's just the beginning of a lot of the public art and sculpture that's placed around the garden. Can you talk a little bit about those? Yes, those slightly larger than life sheep are to evoke our formal pastoral heritage. And that's where we get our steel wool from. But there are other uh, sculptures sprinkled throughout the garden. Um, most of them, I say, are contemporary. Um, so that may not be to your liking, but they pop up here and there in the landscape. So it's a nice um, melange of horticulture and art. And we do occasionally have exhibiting um, art features come in. So right now we do have a Patrick Doherty stick sculpture in sight. And that is now coming into its um, third year. So it's still in pretty good shape. Um, you may have seen Patrick Doherty stick sculptures in other public gardens or arboreta. Um, and they're meant to be just temporary installations. But this mm -hmm. one we have is called Loop de Loop. If you went to the Morris Arboretum website, you would find pictures of it. And families really enjoy uh, running through the different rooms in the stick sculpture. Yeah, I love that it's so interactive and hands-on. And he just installed and I would say this is a year and a half ago at the U.S. Botanic Garden on the National Mall. Um, but of course, because of COVID and other security restrictions, people haven't been able to access it for a while, but hopefully soon. Yes, hopefully soon. It really is made to be an interactive, engaging piece. And um, our piece has been there um, long enough and it's been made with willow. The, some of the willow is actually sprouted at the top. So ours kind of has a green fringe growing from the top of the, the loops. Yeah, I love that it's part of the artwork is the decay of it, the change of it. And in this case, it's actually growing and changing. So maybe it might become permanent in the Morris landscape. <laughs> it might, I'm not sure. <laughs> the other kind of similar uh, piece of art that I love at Morris Arboretum is that kind of tree walk and the giant bird nest that you can sit in. Yes, that's our feature called Out on a Limb. So it starts out at grade at the street level. And then as you walk out onto that, the grain below you slowly drops away. So that when you get out to the end, you're about 50 feet in the air and you're right up in the tree canopy. So it's really you know, an interesting and safe way to, to kind of figure out what it's like to be up in the trees, especially today on a windy day. It would have been um, very entertaining to be up there. Um, but there is also a, a mock oversized bird nest that kids can run around in and sit on the three blue eggs that are in there. And there's also a, a series of nettings put between some of the trees called the squirrel scramble, which in my observation, most um, adults are very reticent to set foot out there. But kids jump right in and bounce up and down. Mm -hmm. So it's a very fun, interactive um, feature in our landscape. Yeah, I'm not a huge fan of heights myself, <laughs> but, but I've been out in the bird's nest and felt totally comfortable up up there. But uh, I was going to say the squirrel, is it a scramble that you said? Yeah, the set, the netting up there is called the squirrel scramble. I uh, know. I think I tried <laughs> one or two rungs of the rope or netting and I was like, nah, I'll be back out here on safe land. <laughs> <laughs> so you must not have too much too much uh, trepidation or fear of heights yourself to be out working on a green roof? Uh, well, I guess that's true. Uh, when I'm up there, I'm wearing a safety harness and I'm always clipped into a pin. So I, I guess I, well, I guess I could fall off the roof, but I wouldn't have enough travel in my lanyard to actually hit the ground. And it's a very shallow slope. So, you know, I don't feel threatened at any time. Like I'm in danger of falling off of the roof. And how do you access the the green roof of that Morris Arboretum Center. So do you just, is there a ladder on the side? Is it from the interior? It's actually pretty nice. From the interior, there's what's called a ship ladder, which is a pretty steep runged ladder with um, handles, railings on each side. And then there's a hatch at the top. So I go up about nine or 10 steps and then I emerge onto the roof. 
when you're up there, how long do you usually stay up there? Is it just for a quick a session of an hour a day or do you spend all day sometimes up there? Well, in the past I have spent all day up there, um, especially when it was being established and we were planting plants and trying to water things in. Uh, now we have, mm, I'd say maybe we spend with volunteer help about four hours a week up there in season. And I'd love to spend longer, but I have other responsibilities. So I don't get to dally too much on my roof. And when you're accessing the roof, now that it's been established, and we'll go back and talk about how you established it in a little bit, but are you looking for certain things? Are you looking for blank spots, weeds, maybe birds nesting up there? Uh, Well, I'm always looking for weeds, and I have no problem finding them. So even though the medium is supposed to be very nutrient poor, there are still many, many plants that would like to make a home up there. Um, I have had nesting killdeer up there when the roof was first installed. That was fun to see. Um, and there are sometimes in the morning when I walk by just a, a ground level past the roof, I, I see like birds peer over the side of me. So I know we have lots of bird visitors, even though there are none currently nesting there. Uh, and a fair amount of insect visitors also. That's a great point. You don't think of a green roof as being, say, a pollinator or an insect haven. Uh you think of it as being amongst the birds, but you can be joined by almost anything up there. Pretty much. If it can fly, it can get up there. But if it has four feet, it does not up there. So I don't have the pressures of deer or squirrels or chipmunks or any of those other critters that could potentially wreak havoc with my plantings. Okay. I'm going to have to include that in my deer proofing talk. Yes. <laughs> green wall or green roof. That's That's a great idea. <laughs> to be up high enough that they cannot reach. So let's talk a little bit about the construction of the green roof that you're on. So there's a lot of different ways of making green roofs. And this one, you were lucky enough that it was designed and formed with a new building, correct? Exactly. So it was engineered, the building was um, engineered in the beginning to take the weight of the green roof. So it wasn't like trying to retrofit an existing structure, which can be more difficult. So the roof that I'm speaking about today, the intensive roof, has about seven to eight inches depth of medium. And when that is fully saturated after a rainstorm, that goes between 45 to 50 pounds per square foot. So that's a heck of a lot of weight that that roof has to hold up. Wow. Um, And I had about 3,500 square feet that is vegetated. So that's an enormous weight to hold up. But if you were to see the inside of this, this the structure. You would see the steel girders and it was designed to hold that weight, plus the weight of people working up there or tools or snow load. Um, so there's no time at all when I'm up there. Does it feel like bouncy or any kind of vibration or it feels very, very sturdy. And when you mentioned snow load, so snow and ice, do you have to go out there and shovel that off or do you just let it always naturally melt? No, no, it just naturally melts. Yeah, I would think that would be a, a maintenance issue that I would not want to face. On a I, no, I, I could not imagine trying to clear snow off of that. <laughs> so for the water weight, which is a huge concern on green roofs, uh, do you have a cistern or other system that collects runoff storm water from that? Actually, we do. The, um, the water goes down through a couple layers and then slowly filters out through some scuppers And then the scuppers direct water into, we have two large above ground cisterns that each hold about 14,000 gallons. And then if they overflow, we have an additional um, underground cistern um, in that same area close by that holds up to 50,000 gallons of water. So then with an electric pump that's in there, I can bring that water back up to water the landscape surrounding the green roofs or the green roof itself. Do you find that you need to water up there that much? Um, I find I do not. If it's a really hot, droughty, dry period in the summer, and I would say if that was like three weeks without appreciable rain, then yes, there is a, an irrigation system that I can turn on, which is nothing more than a, a pop-up residential lawn sprinkler system that was retrofitted up there. So when I need to, I turn that on for about 30 minutes, 
and it has the sprinkler heads oscillate back and forth to cover the entire roof. And then that's it. I turn it off. And that brings us to your plant mix and maybe talking a little bit about the planting medium that you put it in. But first, let's talk about the membrane and what's underneath that green roof. So uh, even though it was a new building that was engineered for a green roof, I imagine there are several layers that separate that from the computers and books and offices and everything that are below that. Yes. So there is uh, there are a number of layers on the roof and there's no one set formula. So that varies from contractor to contractor. It would vary based on your climate. Uh, I guess it varies on your architect. So the building itself, the garage, has a steel roof. But on top of that was put perhaps about half inch thick plywood sheeting. And then on top of that was put a rubber membrane. And this rubber membrane was laid down in sheets. And the roofers had to seam seal where the sheets overlapped. Because that is the waterproof barrier to keep water out of the building. Um, and because this was a slanted roof, um, they were not able to do what they would typically do on a flat roof in that once you put that waterproof, waterproof membrane down, you would flood that and let water sit there for a day or two just to make sure you didn't have any perforations or leaks. Um, so we did not have that option. And fortunately, we have had no leaks. But then on top of that, there are some other layers. Um, one of them is... Um, I call it a drainage board. So it's a multi-layered thing. It has a geotextile, which is kind of a densely woven fabric that lets water come through, but not plant roots. Roots. So that's on the top and the bottom. And then in the center of that, the layer is plastic that looks kind of like egg crate foams, those kind of cup shapes. And in the bottom of each one of those cups is a small perforation. So this, the drainage board, is made to capture the water as it comes down through the medium. The water can sit in those little cups for a little bit, and then it can slowly, by gravity, percolate out down off of the roof. And above the drainage board would be uh, another layer of geotextile membrane to make sure roots or fines from the soil doesn't get through. And then the growing medium itself. And that is not like typical garden soil. That is an engineered mix of different fines, sizes of gravel. There might be some expanded shale or clay in there. And in our area, what was local to us uh, was mushroom compost. So spent mushroom compost from the houses out in Kennett Square was incorporated to give us about a 10% at the most, 10% um, organic component to that roof medium. Do you find that you have to fill in with new growing medium? Does that either blow away with the wind or when you uh, extract maybe some weeds uh, that you have to level it off every once in a while? Uh, we have found that we don't have wind shear, which is nice um, because now the roots have firmly um, permeated all the particles in the roof. So I don't have the problem of wind shear, but occasionally when we do weed, you know, we try to shake off as much of the growing medium as we can, but I do once in a while refresh the medium. So I've done that a couple times in the past few years, but not extensively. And the medium doesn't seem to shift. Gravity does not make it slump towards the bottom of the roof either, because all the plant roots at this point um, keep everything in check. That's a great point. Yeah, I would think that, you know, the weight of it and uh, where you have that even a slight five degree angle would have made some of that uh, come down. So that's great that it's all staying in place with just plant roots. And so most of your plant selections that are you're using on the roof, are they drought tolerance? Are they succulents? What families of plants are you using? Uh, I have a pretty amazing variety up there. We've used, um, I believe, over 75 different plants. And part of the fun has been torturing plants up there to see what lives and what doesn't. Um, so originally our landscape architects spec'd that we were going to replicate a Pennsylvania shale barrens community, which is a great idea, except nobody in the nursery trade is growing those plants. <laughs> so it was hard to implement that plan. So we decided, well, let's look at plants, native and non-native, that we think will take these hot, dry, droughty conditions in full sun and potential wind. So we came up with a, quite a list of things. 
I've had some spectacular failures, but all in all, I've had a lot of successes. Um, and I can discuss those plants with you if you like. Absolutely. I especially want to hear about those spectacular failures. No. Oh, well, okay. <laughs> well, let's start with one of those. Well, we found out our green roof medium had a pH of about eight, which if you know anything about the pH scale, that's a um, pretty high number. Plants generally like to be like maybe 5.5, 6, 7, 7.5. Seven Most plants are adaptable to those pH ranges, but eight I thought was pretty high. Um, so one of the things we tried up there was an Erica, which is in the like rhododendron and azalea family, which definitely wants acidic soils. So acidic soils would be in the lower range of the pH scale, below seven. Well, since we put them into um, a soil medium that was a pH of eight, uh, they promptly checked out. So they were up there for a summer and they said goodbye. <laughs> um, another thing we tried, we know that they're a cold, hardy succulents like yuccas and agaves, especially things from northern Mexico that grow in the high mountains that can take freezing temperatures. So we decided to look at them for cold hardiness and we did put them up there, um, especially agaves, I'm thinking. Uh, agave americana some other agaves we put up there they look great they loved it in the summer it was hot it was dry but since we have really cold moist winters in philadelphia sometimes with rain sometimes with snow we found that the following spring all the crowns had rotted out so we lost to a plant every mm, one that's too bad um, Yet we tried yuccas, and yuccas have like thinner, more fibrous uh, leaves, uh, and yuccas have done fine. Like yuccas have bloomed up there for me. It's pretty amazing. So other some other things we have up there, we planted grasses, um, and I did not listen to Ed Snodgrass, who is the master of green roof plants in Maryland, and he said you should only plant about ten percent of the grasses you think you'll need. Um, so, no, we went with wild abandon. We planted different things like panicums <laughs> and penicetums and schizocuriums. Well, we found that they were just all too happy and have happily seeded all over the roof. So I would say now that most of our maintenance is removing unwanted grasses. So in the last year, we've made a concerted effort to really uh, shrink our number of grasses and the types of grasses up there. So Ed's advice was spot on, you think? It was. <laughs> so if you're going to do a green roof, be very careful with grasses. And what about flowering plants? Uh, you said that the yucca had flowered for you, but other native, perhaps perennials, maybe even annuals? Um, yes, we haven't really done too much in annuals, but um, Aquilegia canadensis, or native columbine, loves it. Self-seeds everywhere. Um, alliums, like Allium cernuum, the nodding onion, or Allium shonopraisum. Again, like our edible, you know, kitchen Allium loves it up there. If I don't deadhead them, they go to seed and they spread around with wild abandon, which is okay if you want to fill in space. Um, lots of different things. Dianthus, not necessarily native Dianthus, but Dianthus have been very happy up there with that silvery blue foliage. They can laugh off the sun um, and they're blooming. I think I have plants that will probably be blooming next week. I saw buds up there today. Um, another really good one, a native Monarda, Bradburyana. That is just fabulous. That laughs at the conditions up there. That's very happy. It started to self-seed around and I highly encourage that. Insects really love that Monarda. Um, and of course we have native cacti, Opuntia. So both our eastern native Opuntia, Humifusa, and Phaeacantha, sorry, these don't have common names really, um, both are happy up there. In fact, the landscape architect wanted me to sprinkle cacti all over the roof, and I declined because I have to tiptoe through those plants. Hmm. So we planted our Opuntia only on the edge where we could manage them and you know, not be stabbed every time we walk by. Yeah, that is definitely a, a concern. <laughs> and weeding around them with tongs and, and leather gloves on. Yes. Um, so that is still a challenge. So when I have to weed that, I put the leather gloves on 
I have these like long 12 inch forceps and I try to pick away in there. <laughs> um, of course, sedums do really well. Um, sedums and sempervivums. And um, I have a number of those different ones up there. Sedum ocri, sedum album. They all do well. And if I had bare spots to fill in, I could just pinch off some of those sedum stems, stick them in the soil somewhere else, and they'll root. Um, some herbs really have done well. Rosemary. Rosemary arp. Loved it. Lavender. Loves it. Thyme. Loves it. As do the bees love thyme. Um, so I've had many, many successes up there. And it's been a lot of fun. And of course, I didn't stop there. I also planted bulbs. Hmm. So right now up there, I have Camassia blooming, which is a Western Pacific Northwest native, but I'll take it. I'll call that native. And different crocus. I've put spring blooming crocus, fall blooming crocus up there, um, grape hyacinth. You might know that. Um, and some of our cute little um, species tulips, none of which are native to North America, but they're some of the earliest blooms up there on the roof. And they're so short that you as a visitor would not notice them from the ground, but uh, me, the gardener, I get to appreciate them. <laughs> yeah, I would never have thought about using small bulbs up on a green roof or even a green wall, but that's a great point because you have such perfect drainage and it's the perfect planting situation for, as you said, many of the Mediterranean herbs, a lot of our uh, succulent and cactuses, and then of course grasses that want pure pure great drainage right anything that likes hot and dry and great drainage very happy up there and you can't overwater, right that's true again the the drainage is really good um even though the medium it has kind of a contrary um mission like i would say so the green roof medium itself has has to be a little bit spongy it has to hold some water but it has to also, you know, let water course through and get down into the drainage layer because you don't want to have a super saturated, extra heavy roof. Yeah, because I I will be the first one to admit I'm an overwaterer of things in pots <laughs> and, <laughs> and sometimes in the ground. So, yeah, that will hold in water. But that this is a perfect uh, place to be planting for those of us who are uh, admitted overwaterers. Um, how about for plant choices uh, that you might use in a green wall as opposed to a, a green roof? So a green wall system, which is basically vertical up and down, right. um, you could probably extend that plant family to even some of the tropicals because it's almost like a drip irrigation system. Yeah, that is what I've seen. A lot of them do have a better um, water delivery system. So water goes to the top from the back, you don't see it. And then, you know, by gravity, it trickles down through your pans or or bins or however it's arranged. So um, things that want more water will probably be happier there. I've seen setups where you can do herbs, you know, you can do lettuce, crops in them which could be fun for the homeowner. You have to have a, a portable green wall system and you can harvest things from it. Um, but you're right. You could do some other tropicals and maybe, you know, if you're not expecting it to be cold hardy, you can certainly do things. Anthuriums would be great in there. Different ferns or if you're in a shady location, you know, I'm thinking of the fabulous green wall that's indoor along with gardens. Mm -hmm. um, what they have in there, many, many ferns. Um, but, you know, also some of the other things we talked about here would be amenable to that. So, again, like the alliums that grow great on my roof, they would be happy there. The rosemary, probably the thyme, and the thyme would probably cascade down the front of the, the planters, which would look nice. It would cover the, um, the mechanics of it. So for the typical homeowner uh, and home gardener, if they wanted to install a green roof or green wall. So let's start with green roof. Um, what would be the first things you're maybe in an established home that they should look at? Okay. Well, I would say your, your house itself is probably not a candidate. Uh, you would have to bring in a structural engineer to assess your roof and how that would have to be reinforced to hold the weight. But maybe you have like a shallow, like what's called a shed roof or a porch roof. The smaller area that you might retrofit to hold a roof, a green roof, or maybe have an outdoor garden shed, or even like a, a dog house. Those could certainly be, you know, smaller areas that would be amenable to green roofing. 
Yeah, I've seen a really nice example of green roof on a doghouse. <laughs> that would be perfect. And keep your pet cooler in the summer. And and it's totally accessible and you don't have to risk the height, right? Exactly. <laughs> and you can enjoy it from ground level. Mm -hmm. But yeah, so it's not just the weight of the plants, the substrate, all those layers that we talked about and the irrigation system maybe, but it's that water weight that we're really concerned about for your structural um, safety in a home. Right, because when that's saturated, that's a heck of a lot of weight that your roof has to carry. And for a green wall, um, I think your main concern is where you're attaching it to and what's behind it. Um, because in some cases, say, water might leak out the back. And if it's, say, against a brick or stone wall, that might not be a problem. But other surfaces, that could be. Right, that's true. So I would, I would expect that you would probably have that anchored, but you would have a potential space of a couple inches between your green roof and whatever your your structure is so that you could avoid having moisture right up against the building. Um, typically, they have a, a pan at the bottom to catch water and recirculate, so you shouldn't have any problems with water seeping into your foundation. And that's for green, for yeah. vertical green for walls. For a vertical wall. Yeah. Yeah. And I see some of those also in, like on casters that you can roll them around. Yeah, I've seen systems where they're freestanding, where you can almost make it a uh, division, say, between uh, two neighbors in a row house yes. uh, situation. Mm -hmm. Those those would be great. Obviously, a little more water intensive. <laughs> and I don't know quite how the pumping system would work to get the water to the top. Right. So it has to have a pump somewhere. So if you can um, attach this to a dedicated, you have like an outdoor line for water, I assume that you would probably have to do that. And then, you know, there's a pump somewhere in there that would recirculate water and get the water up to the top layer. And then by gravity, it'll trickle down um, into the pans or, or bags or whatever it has, the trays below. And aside from the gorgeous green wall you noted at Longwood Gardens, are there others in the Mid-Atlantic area, green roof or green wall systems that you recommend that the public can go and look at? Hmm. Well, I know if you're in Pittsburgh, the PNC Bank building has a fabulous uh, vertical green wall that's a couple stories. I think they have their logo incorporated into that. Um, I'm thinking down in the Metro DC area, you have some and I haven't, I can't give you a name because I'm not familiar down there. But I know a lot of the federal buildings have green roofs. Mm -hmm. um, I remember seeing some spectacular ones in the Miami, Florida area actually seeing one in, installed down there. Wow. Can you describe that that one being installed? That was, again, multi-story. That was probably five or six stories on a high-end residential condominium building. And they had all the, the metal framework was up and the planting it looked like pans were in there. And then the workers were up on these giant lift trucks and they were actually planting the day I was there. So it's going to be a really interesting um, facade. Now, since it was Miami, they can plant, you know, things that we can't because of our cold temperatures. But I imagine this was going to be a big, lush, green cascade by the time they were done. And I can imagine some of that maintenance. You have to be up there on a cherry picker yes. uh, every year. <laughs> Say, what the, the thing that I find of maybe a maintenance issue on green walls that I don't think a lot of people think about is that those little drip emitters into each cell uh, at each plant's root zone can get plugged up. Do yes. you find that on your rooftop? No, I don't have emitters like that, but yes, I found that the, um, the overhead system that we have, which is made for residential lawns, uh, those heads get clogged all the time. So there is periodic maintenance there. I think you have been to Glenstone in Potomac, Maryland, correct? Yes, I've been there. So there's the Split Rocker Sculpture by Jeff Coons, and it's essentially a green roof on the top of its head. Yes. <laughs> and a green wall all the way around and then under its chin as well. So it's this giant sculpture of a rocking horse head type of uh, split rocker, as, as per the name, um, that's planted up with annuals. So it's a seasonal green roof or green wall installation. Um, so it's basically April through October-ish. And that has a, a big 
plinth that it sits out on with a recirculating cistern underneath it. Um, can you describe that a little bit more, Louise? Um, yes, as I recall, that was all planted in annuals, and there's a big, I guess it's a metal armature, and then in, into that they have stuffed, I think it's peat, and then within that they put the individual annual plants. So I don't know how many thousands of annuals that requires to do, but I'm glad I'm not the horticulturist there for that project. <laughs> I do know that it's a several days project to plant it up in the springtime. And then the rest of the year, that like October, November through March, say, you can still go and see the split rocker, but you're just seeing the green fabrication over the armature. So it's like a green landscape cloth, basically. Right. But even that would be interesting to see without the plants. Um, and I can't imagine, like you say, those emitter heads must get clogged. So I'm I'm sure their horticulturists spend a fair amount of time troubleshooting because without water, those plants, I'm sure, would start to suffer. And then you'll have brown spots and then you'll have to replace plants during the season and mm -hmm. um, talk about high maintenance. Yeah, definitely high maintenance. <laughs> and I know that the artist had prescribed a palette. You know, there's definitely an eye where it's a juga, I believe, and some white flowers around it so you yes. do see the eye of the split rocker and then the rest is kind of multicolored, um different like zinnias coleus depending on what size and where it is in the wind but there's de a definite pattern and, and that has to be placed on there and i guess when a couple plants fail that has to be repaired <laughs> immediately because it is a public work of art that's you know being visited every day and i know that they had said that the the struggle really was that shadow under the chin. So if you can imagine a rocking horse head and then that underneath the chin uh, cannot be the same type of annual flowers you have everywhere else. Right. Because essentially they're going to be growing in the shade. So mm -hmm. you have to have a yeah. different choice. Um, and then I'm sure, I'm not sure, but I would assume that they probably have some wind stress on that. Mm -hmm. And then I would think, you know, the Western side probably dries out faster um, and with the sun on there in the summer, I'm guessing they may be replacing plants more frequently on the western side than the eastern side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it's sitting up on the top of a hill there that's elevated, so you actually get a nice view of the countryside around it in Potomac, Maryland. But yeah, the exposure is much more, I think, than a, a normal green roof or green wall would, would be handling. So any other... Um, I was going to say artworks or green sculptures that you can think of. Um, I know in Atlanta Botanic Garden, they've had um, a whole series of uh, what they call mosaic sculptures, which again were armatures planted up with a whole different panoply of live plants. And they still have, I believe down there, um, the, uh, the earth goddess. She's planted in, in, a, in front of a big pool of water. So it's like her head and torso and she has long hair that flows over her shoulder. And these are all planted in different, um, mostly annuals, I believe, down there. So she's really beautiful. And they are, they've been in um, Toronto, I believe. And I think there was a traveling exhibition at one point, but I know there are some certain permanent mm -hmm. features at Atlanta Botanic Garden. So the, the Earth Goddess is there. Um, they had a couple of fun shaggy dogs that were done with carex, a type of grass. I was going to say they're almost like topiaries, but they're planted. So right. you, cre you create uh, some type of earthen or metal armature and then stuff it with peat or some type of growing medium and then plug the plants in. But yeah, that, that goddess is amazing. And and every once in a while, you see it make the rounds of social media, like yeah. on, on Facebook, or there'll be the ones from the, the ones you mentioned from Toronto and also in China. Um, so there'll be like a dragon that's planted up all in plants. And, and I think both Disney US properties have a few of those installations as well. Yeah, they're pretty amazing, and I I know for the Atlanta one in the in uh, in December they've had her lighted up at night with like kind of looks like bluish white LEDs, so it looks almost you know chilly even though we know it's Atlanta. It's not snowy. Aside from being up on the rooftop, <laughs> and, <laughs> and your other tasks at Morris, how do you spend your free time? Do you have a home garden, and what does it look like? 
I do have a home garden, and uh, my home garden is, is fairly small compared to what I garden at the Arboretum, but I am a zone denier, and I love tropicals. So, <laughs> you know, I have some spring bloomers right now. I do have spring bulbs, uh, but my garden really comes on late July into August when the cannas, the bananas, um, the dahlias, all those things um, really come on. I like to have a nice jungly effect. And in the very back of my property, I have what I call a tiki hut, which I built from repurposed materials. So that's a covered seating area up there for two. And I can look out at my tropical paradise with my caladiums, my dahlias, um, a lot of the cold cages. I have the giant elephant ears that just go wild. Um, so I, when I sit there, I can't even see the front of my property or the street. It's, um, <laughs> it's amazing how well it grows in. And I do have a small water feature, so I have the sound of water, and I have frogs. Nice. And I love that what you have at home is so different from what you have at your workplace. Yes. Well, I kind of figured out how to put a green roof on in my shed here, so so I haven't done that. <laughs> so uh, when you're relaxing at your tiki hut and overseeing your home jungle, are you looking for other garden venues to speak at and write at. I know we're both members of Garden Communicators, Garden Com, and that you've par partnered with one of our past guests on Garden DC, and that's Eva Monheim, who was on on episode 12 talking about uh, hedges and shrubs. Yes, so you have uh, met and talked to Eva. She and I are uh, have formed a company called Verdant Earth Educators. And we are trying to spread the good news about all things green. So we have done some in-person training, which has come to a, a temporary hiatus due to COVID now. But we are educating um, people in the commercial world um, and also homeowners um, as to different things to do correctly with plants, especially our focus with woody trees and shrubs, although we certainly do know annuals and perennials. But as Eva has written, the wonderful book for homeowners on trees and shrubs. They really are the backbone of your landscape. So sometimes people are afraid to prune them or really don't know what to do. So I think her book is an excellent how-to manual. And we've been trying to reinforce through our live instruction um, how you can best make these plants assets in your home landscape. So you'll come out to say, uh, HOA, a homeowners association, or to a municipality or a county and train those who are in charge of the landscapes to take care of them? Yes, we have done trainings like that. And I've done some individual um, homeowner assessments too. And someone found me here locally, I'm not sure how, um, and said, oh, you're an arborist. I said, yes, I am. So I went over to a young couple and they had just purchased their house and we looked at their existing landscape and woody trees and um, we made recommendations. And I guess it was last year in October, I went over there and I actually taught them how to prune and take care of their trees. They had some fruit trees that they wanted to see. Can they get them to fruit? Um, so I showed them pruning techniques, told them what to expect this spring, and I'll be following up with them shortly. Yeah, I think pruning is one of those skills that needs to be done in person. Like you can do a lot on Zoom, yeah. <laughs> but it's so hard to teach somebody and to show them the cuts uh, without doing it side by side in their garden. Yes. So it was fun for me with this couple to actually show them and I had them make the cuts to reinforce what they were learning, you know, and explain why as we went along. So um, hopefully that has made them confident pruners. Yeah. So any final thoughts or advice for maybe the home gardener who wants to do a mini green roof or green wall? Well, I would say start small. Um, like I said, a doghouse, maybe you have a small out structure. Do you have uh, maybe like a lean to where you keep your know, trash or refuse cans? Those are all kind of good, would be good small starting um, projects. Um, I would say you just need to be wary of the pitch on your roof um, because if you have a, a fairly, I don't know, maybe more than 12 or 15 degrees, you would probably have to put horizontal strips called battens in because you don't want your plants or your medium to slip down towards the lower edge. 
Um, so you can accommodate that that way. Um, but a lot of the plants uh, are pretty amenable, as I said, and you can get things like you can get columbines or, you know, alliums. You could have herbs on a roof. Um, hmm. You can even do some small shrubs. I have junipers that do really well up on my roof. Um, so I think it can be a fun experiment. And if it's low enough, you know, you're not going to plant on top of a building. You'll be able to monitor and see when it needs water and you can just play the hose on it when you need to. And that does bring up sourcing. So for most of the plants on your green roof at the Morris Arboretum, where they started as plugs from seed or a little bit larger plants? I had a whole combination. Some things we could we got as plugs for economy because if you wanted to plant 50 or 60 or something, plugs are certainly cheaper than gallons or two gallons. Um, but a lot of the shrubs that we use were generally gallon-sized. And over the years, I've had the propagator at the Arboretum help me propagate some things, namely um, penstemons from seed that we've tried up there. Um, but, you know, like you get stuff like in a three-inch pot at your retail garden center. That's a fine size for you to incorporate into a green roof planting. Hmm, terrific. And I can imagine uh, many of the rock garden type of plants would be at home there as well. Absolutely fabulous. I mean, that's how I ended up joining my local rock garden society because I thought, hey, you know, those people are growing plants at like full sun, dry conditions. It sounds just like my roots. So I'm going to go talk to those people and have them recommend plants to me. And oh, they welcomed me with open arms and gave me seeds and plants and suggestions. And um, it's been a, a, a happy uh, affair since. <laughs> nice. All right. So uh, how can listeners contact you if they want to your services from the Verdant Earth Company or consulting? They can um, find me or my partner, Eva, at verdanteartheducators.com. And also, if you want to contact me at the university, you can use my local email there, which is L-O-C-L-A at U-P-E-N, which is letters U. P E N N dot E D U. Terrific. Thanks, Louise. You're welcome. It was a fun talk, Kathy. Bleeding Hearts Plant Profile Bleeding Hearts Lamprocapnus spectabilis, formerly Dicentra spectabilis look so enchanting in the garden with their neat rows of hanging hearts in mid-spring. This old-fashioned favorite is also known as lyre flower, lady's locket, and lady in the bath. This woodland perennial likes to be planted in some shade with a bit of morning sun. It prefers soil that is moist but well-draining, with lots of composted leaf mold added in for amendment. It is hardy from USDA zones 2 through 8. This plant goes dormant in the heat and humidity of summer in our mid-Atlantic region. So place them among ferns and hosta, which will fill in as the bleeding hearts die back. It can reach a height of two to three feet and forms loose, bushy clumps. It has a thick, fleshy root that can be divided and replanted in late winter, just before the spring growth starts. It can also self-seed, unless it is a sterile variety. The common garden variety has blooms of rosy pink, but the white version is just as lovely. Newer cultivars like Ruby Gold and King of Hearts can have different colored flowers and foliage. Some of these are quite spectacular. There is also a native fringed bleeding heart, Dicentra eximia. It is a bit more demure than the cultivated varieties, but just as enchanting. Bleeding hearts, you can grow that. What's new in my garden this week? Well, the lilacs are perfuming up the block and the other spring blooming shrubs are bursting into bloom. Those include the Wygela, Calicanthus, and Dutzia. And of course, I can't forget azaleas. And if you don't have azaleas in your own home garden, or even if you do and just wanna immerse yourself 
in all that azalea glory uh, that can be had in the DC area in springtime. We're updating our list of top azalea viewing sites on the Washington Gardener blog. So look for that post in the next couple days. And I highly recommend a visit to many of these sites in the next week or so because azaleas are at peak. That includes Brighton Dam in Brookville, Maryland, Brookside Gardens in Wheaton, Maryland, Macrillis Garden in Bethesda, Maryland, in DC. We can't forget the incredible azalea collection at the U.S. National Arboretum. There's also beautiful azaleas to be seen at Hillwood and Tudor Place. In Northern Virginia, Green Spring Gardens and Meadowlark Botanic Gardens also offer wonderful azalea displays. Happy gardening and happy garden touring. Thank you for listening to Garden DC. You can become a listener supporter for as little as 99 cents a month by going to anchor.fm slash garden DC slash support. Another way to support this podcast is to subscribe to our monthly digital publication, Washington Gardener Magazine. To do so, go to washingtongardener.com. Thank you. You can find Washington Gardener online at WashingtonGardener.com, on Twitter at WDC Gardener, on Instagram at WDC Gardener, and on Facebook.com at Washington Gardener Magazine.